أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and upon all the prophets who came before him One of the things that all of the prophets preached السلام, peace be upon them all, was that of moderation. And I think that's something that's important to start with this lecture, which is the lecture called Food Spirituality, Advancement of Regression. And so the first part, Food Spirituality, what we're going to really analyze is the spiritual aspect of our religion in regards to food. You know, and, and we find in Islam that a lot of the teachings of Islam revolve around food. They revolve around community. They're meant to bring us together and to have us eat together. Many of the activities that we participate in. And so we find that in our societies that having control of food and what it pertains to really dictates the culture of the people and the state of the people. And when we, you know, when we take this and we apply it to the United States of America currently, and then we take a look at you know, the obesity rates in America, or we take a look at the obesity rates even in our home countries, and then we look at other people who are starving, and we find these extremes and we can look, you know, we can take America, for instance, because this is the country that we live in. And we can look at, you know, the, for instance, when we look at the TV, the things that are being sold to us, you know, that have uh, immense trans fat, which is something that is man-made. Um, you know, there's saturated and unsaturated fat, and then there's, there's trans fat, which is a lot from a lot of fried foods and different things. And then we can look at the amount of sugar that people are taking in. And so it's important to, to take a look at these things and then also relate them back to a Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and really get an understanding of, of what really is advancement and what really is regression. You know, because a lot of people, they associate the West, you know, with advancement. That the West, that, that the, the colonial powers of, of, of Britain, Britain and the U.S., you know, they're advanced, they're educated, they're civilized. And then they look at, you know, they put a lens on the teachings of religion and tradition and those of the indigenous, the Native Americans, the, you know, tribes of the past. And they say, no, those are uncivilized. But rather when we really take a close look at some of the practices of even the Native Americans who were here before the Puritans came from Britain, you know, when we even take a look at what they did, there are certain practices which we're about to look at, which were very close to the practices of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, which are now seen as uncivilized as well. But closer and closer we start to find that science is starting to wake up. And articles are coming out, you know, recently that, for instance, fasting is good for you. You know, fasting two times a week restarts your metabolism and this and that. And as Muslims, we know. We know. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to fast Monday and Thursday. We know these things. And we know the prescriptions that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to give pertaining to food that our modern society hasn't caught on to, but we've known for quite a while. So it really starts with, uh, and I, I have a PowerPoint here that I was planning on using, but I'm just gonna keep it to myself 
for now. But when we look at the first part is when we look at food culture, and then we can look on a, on a global level, uh, national level, local level, uh, family. You know, family level. What is the you know the state of health and food within our families, and as an individual, uh, what what exactly is is going on? So, the first thing I want to focus on is the Western food culture versus the indigenous, and the indigenous is the, the Native American tribes who are essentially exterminated from this very country we sit in. Um, and so, and a lot of their culture was also assimilated and exterminated and abolished and is not present anymore. And so we have here an, ex an excerpt from an article that talks about the forming of the three daily meals. You know, we all have this thing in our mind that's embedded, ingrained into our mind that's telling us breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Where did this actually come from though, right? And so here's an excerpt that says the three daily meals that the settlers brought evolved, American, evolved with American lifestyles. As people became more prosperous, they added meat to breakfast and dinner. After the Industrial Revolution, when people began to work away from home, the midday meal became more of a casual affair and the cooked meal shifted to the end of the day when workers came home. The one thing that did not change was the overall amount of food that people ate despite the fact that they had largely abandoned the active lifestyles of the farm in favor of sedentary ones in cities and suburbs. And the quote is, people were still eating these giant country breakfasts. And soon doctors reported that more of their patients were suffering from indigestion. So what can we take from this? Essentially, people be, started to live less active lifestyles when they moved from essentially farms to cities However, they kept these massive diets that they were eating. And, and furthermore, kind of this organization of breakfast, lunch, and dinner that we talk about, that people tell us are so healthy for us, that this is what civilized eating looks like. But rather, they found that it caused indigestion. Um, so here, let's, let's talk a little bit about fasting. And so, here we, here we see that the one thing that might actually improve your metabolism, he's saying, is periodic fasting, which we know the Rasul them did. And so this eating pattern we found in the Native Americans, that whenever they didn't have proper food, what they would do is they would fast. And they would fast regularly. And so when the European settlers came, they immediately wrote off the Native Americans as savages, as uncivilized, as uneducated. And you know, this is something that, you know, we can talk about the European settlers, but even now, Western thought believes that they have prevailed in every ideology. Whether it's political ideologies, whether it's, you know, whatever economic ideologies, social ideologies, whatever you want to look at, the Western train of thought is that they are the most advanced in all of these. So <clears throat> that is something that they inherited and it's called the colonial gaze. That whatever lens they come to look at knowledge, they interpret it in that set and they degrade it and discredit it. And that includes the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad And so we have here a scientist, and what he's saying, the scientist Matson, he's saying that caloric deprivation acts as a mild stress that helps cells build up their defenses, warding off damage from aging, environmental toxins, and other threats. And other research has shown that periodic fasting may also prevent heart disease. So we're finding here the essential narrative that whatever Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi prescribed and whatever Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has prescribed for us is what's best for us. Whether we understand it, whether we have the knowledge to understand it or not. But for the most part, in America, religion is fairly secularized. As in, even when we want to talk about Salah, 
we're going to talk about, oh, how it's good for our joints and how it, you know, is good for our mind and it's so peaceful and this and that. We're always looking, oh, what's the benefit? What's the benefit? We've secularized our own religion rather than if I were to tell you, you know, pray because Allah told you to. Eat this because Allah told you to. This is kind of considered, you know, archaic. It's kind of considered, you know, old and outdated. Tell me why. Give me the benefits. So then it comes to, of course, our food spirituality expert, uh, Dr. Prophet Muhammad And Rasul said something of, of eating and of the stomach. And uh, Imam Ahmad uh, records that uh, Al Muqdam bin Maktarib al Kindi said that he heard the Messenger of Allah وسلم, saying, The son of Adam will not fill a vessel or a pot worse for himself than his stomach. It is enough for the son of Adam to eat a few bites that, strengthen, that strengthens his spine. If he likes to have more, then let him fill a third with food, a third with drink, and leave a third for breathing. So Rasul gives us some advice. And he says, however you like to eat, separate it into thirds, or thidith, that's what they say in Arabic. And um, a third for food, a third for drink, and a third for breathing. And so we all know this. And you know, alhamdulillah, I mean, it's, it's definitely tough in this American food culture to you know, put the brakes on and say, you know, I'm gonna take control of you know, every single little thing that I put into my body. And you know, it's very easy to, you know, because alhamdulillah, we, we have so much food and we, we have all of these things. But at the same time, we have to be aware that these things are also, you know, there's a balet in them, there's a, a test in them. And it, it's very important to, to understand that, you know, excess, is, is, is not a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala necessarily. How we respond is the blessing. You know, uh, Fir'aun, uh, are you going to say Fir'aun was blessed? Are you going to say Qarun was blessed? Are you going to say the, these people in the, in the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them so much, but ultimately they earned hellfire, are you going to say they're blessed? No, so of course, we are blessed, alhamdulillah, with the food that we have and the, and the wealth that we have and the, the state of health that we have. But ultimately, if we mishandle them, it, it's a curse. So then that bears the question, eat to live or live to eat? And food culture in America tells us, live to eat. You know, um, we, we're working, we're doing all of these things, but ultimately the goal is that we want to eat good food, we want to have some good drinks, we want to be with good family, we want to enjoy. Right? And that, that's the, the goal here, but in Islam we know that we eat to live. And this is advice to me first. I actually, I picked this topic because I felt that I needed it because I felt that I was letting go a little bit, so I was like, I need to get back on track, inshallah. So I, I, this is really just a reminder to all of us, in essence, to be more conscious, a little bit more conscious, because it's so easy to, to let go. I mean, I, I did a couple marriages these last two weeks, and the amount of sweets that are just in front of me is like, it's crazy. Uh, alhamdulillah, so we're just, Take them as kind, kind, gentle reminders to, you know, try to make some little changes. I don't want to get, you know, too hard on anyone. So, I want to now categorize a little bit of the way we eat. And, you know, of course, you know, haram, what's permissible, what's obligatory, what's, uh, you know, fard, what's wajib, and what is haram, of course. So, obligatory. Uh, is that which will ward off death. So you need to eat to live. 
And if a person stops eating and drinking until he dies, then he dies a sinner. He committed a sin. He, he killed himself, essentially. So this is referring to those people who don't eat in the name of zuhud, like they're, they're disattaching from the world. And this is, a, this is one extreme in the system. And the scholar said that this person is worse than the one who overeats. That the person who, you know, hurts himself out of not eating is worse than the one who hurts himself while overeating. And then there's that which is rewarded, and that is which will give him more energy, or her more energy, that he's able to carry out the responsibilities of his life, to pray more, um, and do all of these things to seek knowledge, to work, to, to feed others, to you know, do all the things that you know life requires of us. And permissible, which is more than the rewarded, is to eat to one's fill. So now we're talking about filling filling up your stomach, which is what probably most of us do. Um, and that is so you may have physical strength. So this is for the people that work out. You know, if you're, if you're working out and you have, you know, what we talk about, if you have a big output, then you need a big input. As if, if you're expending a lot of energy, then you need to be eating. So in this case, you need to look at your, your output and your input, and you need to eat more if you're expending more energy. Of course, that's essentially what it means. And um, the last one, and this one, uh, many scholars um, say it's haram. Um, there's also different interpretations. So the best way to look at it is just as uh, advice. And this is, uh, refers to eating more than one's fill, unless the intention is to strengthen yourself to fast or to not embarrass the guest. So essentially, if you have a guest who's eating a lot of stuff, you don't want to eat two bites and then stop eating because your guest might consider this offensive. So there, in that case, you may eat as much as your guest is eating, even if it pains you, because this is part of Islam, that we honor our guests, right? And this is a priority. And it just, that shows you really the, the mercy of Islam. The, the rahmah that, that we find here, that we, you know, we treat people, you know, that we don't want to hurt their feelings, even in the slightest sense. And we have the, the hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you guys know him, where he's uh, eating the sour grapes, right? He's with the Sahaba, and an old man comes and offers him the sour grapes, and he eats one. And then he keeps eating, he keeps eating, and the Sahaba are like, you know, the Prophet usually shares his food. So they're like, why isn't he sharing his food? Essentially. So then he eats all the grapes, and the man leaves, he's very happy that the Prophet ate all his grapes. And then the Sahaba asks the Rasul, you know, why don't you share your grapes? And he said, if I, they were sour, he says they're sour. And if I had given them to you, you would have all started making faces and this and that. And then the man would have left very sad. So we see here the, the immense consideration, you know, towards the guest. Or towards anyone, you should say. But, so eating to the point where you're essentially, you know, when we eat and then we always make jokes about, you know, uh, loosening the belt or like you know these things where we're so full that we're just gonna like sit back and you know do all of these things and we're putting our hands on our stomachs and laughing and that kind of food culture is excessive and it's not part of Islam okay so setting boundaries uh, the Hanbalis used to say um, it is permissible to eat a great deal so long as it does not harm. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said it's makruh to eat that which leads to indigestion and some narrated that this is haram. So eating to the point where your stomach hurts 
is some say it's haram, some say it's makruh. The point is that we want to avoid it to some extent. And I find that, you know, some people do that all the time. Others do it like on occasions, um, like special occasions, like weddings and, you know, different things. And the most important part of it is that we're absolutely conscious. I, was like, I can't emphasize that more. That we're, we're, you know, internalizing the stimulus of, of that which we're intaking. You know, whether it's our, our eyes, our ears, our nose, you know, whatever we're seeing, whatever we're eating, that we're conscious of it. Okay, so how do we know, you know, that, that we're eating right and that we're eating spiritually? So one of the things is that fullness is that which weighs heavily in the stomach and makes a person slow to do acts of worship and leads to feeling sleepy and lazy. So it feels heavy in the stomach, makes you generally slow, sleepy, and lazy. That's how you know that you're doing it wrong. On the other side, <clears throat> in relation to food, whenever the Quran mentions the word halal, which indicates what is permissible, it also mentions the word tayyib, which means pure. And it usually mentions it immediately after. Halana wa tayyiba. It always comes together a lot of the times. And what it's meant by permissible and pure is that the food is not simply good to eat, but it is morally sound food. It is ethically sound food. And it also has the meaning in the Arabic language of lawful, pure, esteemed. So a person who is cheery and of good disposition is called tayyib. So after you eat, you know, if you're happy and you're feeling good, you know, you're healthy, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, that is a sign that you're eating tayyib, that you literally are tayyib. And you're sweet, you're pure, you know, if people, you know, you're, communing, you're communicating with people, you know, in a good way, in a kind way, with energy, with charisma. Um, and this is, this is a good sign. Okay. So now let's talk about some prophetic foods. And, you know, we'll talk about Aisha radiallahu anha for a little bit. And here we talk about Aisha radiallahu anha. And she says that she used to recommend talbina for the sick and, and for someone who is grieving over a dead person. And she said that this thing, she heard a Rasul sallam say it gives rest to the heart of the patient and it makes active and relieves some sorrow and grief. And here we find that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to pre prescribe food for ailments even more than he prescribed herbs or medicines. So we find here that food is a, is a healer. And we'll talk about some of these you know, healers coming up. So here's another one. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used everything from barley soup to honey to camel's milk to heal his followers and advise them to eat certain foods to prevent or cure other ailments. And we find in the general tradition of the world that food is one of the oldest and most respected healing tools available. And even the first fruits of paradise, of Jannah, the apple, the pomegranate, have hundreds of curative properties. And Chinese and Indian healers have used the properties of food to heal for thousands of years. So we find that you know, going natural, right? The, a lot of the nutrients and the micronutrients and the vitamin and minerals, you know, that, that we need, you know, are essential to the way of life that we're trying to live. And um, it's essentially much harder to do that in this society because most of the stuff that's, that's in the market is processed. You know, they're, they're, they're processed and the, and the other thing is, you know, we're having children and we're not, 
you know, giving them, you're not having them get the right taste in their mouths and the taste of these vegetables and fruits and you know, all of these things. So when they grow old, not even old, when they're growing and they're growing into their teen, teen years, they just say they don't like anything. Oh, I don't like anything, I don't like anything, I don't like. You know, and they just want more sugar and more processed foods and more and more and more. And it, it's destroying them. And so, you know, it's important for yourself, you know, to, to try your best to do these things, but also for the sake of your children, to try your best to add these to your diet. So, prophetic food and drink, with a question mark. A lot of times, all of us, we tend to eat and drink at the same time. And I'm definitely guilty of this. You know, I love to drink something while I'm eating. I always do. Um, the fact of the matter is, Rasul there's a story in Sahih Bukhari that says that Rasul came out from the valley of a mountain and there were some dried dates on a shield before us. We called him and he ate with us and he did not touch water. And experts in this field say that com food combining informs us that water impedes the digestive process in the stomach when eaten within a half an hour of a meal. So if we're going to drink water, we should do it before or a half an hour after. And drinking water before, what that's going to do for us is going to make us eat less. Okay. So, on naturel, here are some of the foods that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi ate and which also there's a hadith pertaining to them. So, there's barley, which is good for fevers and it's used in a soup form. And we know Rasul Sallallahu he used to have fevers double what we had. So if people have fevers of 100 degrees, Rasul Sallallahu used to have fevers that were 200 degrees. Much more severe than the average person. And he would withstand them, and these are some of the things that he did, like having barley soup, which is... Uh, and then the second one is Tama. Uh, the Prophet said that a house without dates has no food. That a house that has no dates has no food. And also, he gives it to the child at childbirth. When the child's born, they take just a little tiny bit of tama and they give it to the child and actually they did a study on this I didn't include it in my presentation they did a study that the that little jolt of glucose that's in the day the sugar helps the child even survive if it's in question of, of, of dying that little amount of sugar um, helps it exponentially helps the child so there's you know people say you know why did Russell size and do this like is he just doing it no this is very legitimate you know there's a reason why he's doing it we might not know the reason as how we might not know the reason but they did it and now we know the immense benefits of it um, the third one is figs which is clean and it's a fruit for, of the fruit of paradise and it's a cure for, for many things as well. I want to just for one second though go back to Tamar. For me personally, you know, I always forget to, to eat more dates. And you know, but when I do, for instance, the, the best times that I find it, it's like, you know, for instance, when you're getting up in the morning, you know, American culture always says, you know, eat these big breakfasts, right? Eat, breakfast is the most important. Eat your biggest meals of the day in the morning. But actually, you know, when we, when we look at it, you know, these things, 
from our standpoint aren't the most valid points. And rather, you know, some people may say, you know, why eat yourself to the point where you know you may get sleepy, you may get lazy. Rather, Tamar has a jolt of energy and it's better than any energy drink that you can have. So having a couple of pieces of tamar, you know, and putting that in your routine and also saying that I'm doing this to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when we take in these prophetic foods, that we're coming closer to our Rasul sallam, and we're coming closer to Allah. So part of, you know, food spirituality is the intention. Because you'll read a lot of these ahadith, right? For instance, the next one. Um, here, let me find. Go. For instance, uh, Rasul Sallallahu said of melons, of different types of melons, he said, none of your women who are pregnant and eat of watermelon will fail to produce offspring that is in good countenance and in good character. This is Sahih Muslim and Bukhari. And so you hear a hadith like this, right? You hear a hadith like this, right? And you say, watermelon, how is that gonna make me have good offspring, right? But it doesn't work unless you understand it and you believe it. So what we're talking about here is in general, having this type of nutrition and this type of nutritional spirituality. You know, and a lot of us are gonna sit here and say, I don't understand how this hadith is gonna do these things for me. But this is where it, co it comes in you know, as a personal matter, as a matter of Iman. You know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see it in, in Surah Al-Baqarah, you know, He says, لا يستحي أن يضرب مثلا ما بعودة Right? He's not shy to make a method even of a mosquito. He's not shy to make an analogy or metaphor even if it's a mosquito. And when you look at the mosquito, Scientists who are Muslim, who have studied the mosquito, they say the mosquito is the more complex than any drone or any helicopter or plane or, you know, thing. The mosquito is more complex when you look at it, the intricacies of it, than anything any man has ever made. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he's not scared to make a method about a mosquito. And it's the same thing here. You know, people who believe are going to take these ahadith and they're going to say, I'm going to do it. But people who have, you know, so many things in their head and they're all over the place, they're going to say, this is garbage. What do I need with this? So it's upon us as Muslims to, yes, we need to have intellect. We need to be intellectual. But at the same time, Islam is what it is, and that is to surrender, to submit. And so, sometimes we don't know the answers, and we don't know the wisdom behind something, but we have to follow it. Right? And it's just telling you to eat melons. So, I mean, at the same time, it's not that big of a deal. But, <laughs> um, yes, so, let me keep going. Okay, so the next one is grapes. Uh, Prophet was very fond of grapes. Uh, purifies the blood, provides vigor and health, strengthens the kidneys, and clears the bowels. And the next one is honey. Um, considered the best remedy for diarrhea when mixed in hot water is the food of foods, the drinks of drinks, and the drugs of drugs. What this means is honey is a remedy to many, many, many things. Such as also is the, the black seed, right? Where Rasul Sallallahu you know, said the, the, the black seed is, is the cure to, to many things. So honey is used for creating appetite, strengthening the stomach, eliminating phlegm. It's a meat preservative, it's hair conditioner, eye soother, mouthwash, and it's extremely beneficial in the morning with warm water. 
So more natural. Uh, milk, the Prophet said that milk wipes away heat from the heart, just as the finger wipes away sweat from the eyebrow. It strengthens the back, improves the brain, renews vision, and drives away forgetfulness. And so see you, now we see here uh, the immense benefits of milk that Rasulullah told us about. And there's more. Olive oil, uh, treatment for skin, hair, delays old age, and treats inflammation of the stomach. Uh, water, the Prophet said the best drink in this world is water. When you're thirsty, drink it by sips and not gulps, because gulp, gulps produce sickness of the liver. So when we drink water, drink it three sips, as per the Sunnah. And pomegranate, the Prophet said it cleanses you of shaitan and any evil aspirations for 40 days. And last one is vinegar, uh, food Prophet Muhammad used to eat with olive oil. So essentially, you know, a lot of the things that we're looking at are things that you know we we could have you know that we talk about from you know salad and different fruits and vegetables and all of these things and it's you know immensely important because we talked about in the beginning you know the the core of our diets now are all meat and some type of bread or rice meat bread rice meat bread rice right and and even when we look at the caliphate of Umar ibn Khattab he had limited meat to two days a week. That they would only meet, eat meat two days a week. And you know, this wasn't necessarily a dietary restriction, it was also a economic restriction. But that's not exactly the point. Um, the point is here that yes, as Muslims, we're not vegetarians. You know, we're supposed to, to eat meat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, That you eat from it. But at the same time, we're not excessive in our meat. And that's actually not, that's contradicts. Because if you look at Arab culture right now, Arab culture, they bring you all of these meats and this and that. Even American culture, Everything is now meat centric. That's not right either. And it's funny because the lack of the lack of adab, you know, from Muslims towards vegetarians, they insult vegetarians, they insult vegans, they insult. But at the same time, these vegans and these vegetarians are consuming more prophetic foods than we are. And the lack of lack of adab that we have, that we're rude to them, as if. Look at us, so carnivores, meat eaters, you know, as if it's like prideful, it's given. This is wrong, this is disgusting. <coughs> so at the same time, we need to be conscious of ourselves. And also, that we talked about in the beginning, what is halal and tayyib. So a lot of times we say, oh, this meat is halal, this meat is halal. And then we walk into the halal meat store, and we find the place is dirty. And this and that and this and that. This is not tayyib, it's not halal. Right? So at the same time, we also need to be conscious of just because it's slaughtered and bismillah, that's not enough. There needs to be also ihsan in the way that we carry ourselves in the way that also we hold accountable the people we're getting our meat from. And you'll see that there's more and more places coming out with you know, halal meat and different meats um, that are more respectful to the environment and more respectful to animals and more respectful of doing all these things, right? And the reality is that the Muslims should be the best at this. They should be the most conscious of this. Rather you find that many Muslims don't treat animals with respect. And they say, oh, Allah created these animals so we could use them. Case closed. You know? But the fact of the matter is that we should have a great relationship with animals. You know, uh, and, and not just kindness to animals, but also that we need to learn from animals. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there in them is abra. There's instruction, there's observations, there's knowledge to gain from them. There's understanding. So at the same time, we have to look at our, our respect towards animals. Where's our halal and tayyib in that respect? The last thing I wanted to uh, focus on <clears throat> is that our adab also with people who are overweight. You know, this, there's a lot of people who are obese and it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem and even, you know, our children may struggle with obesity and, and people that we know and friends and this and that. So Rasul Sallallahu we know he never publicly pointed out people's mistakes. But there are a few examples where he did. And there's this, you know, very interesting hadith where Rasul Sallallahu you know, says to a man with a very large stomach. And he says, had this been, referring to the stomach, he said, had this been on somebody else, it would have been better for you. Meaning that the food you're wasting by overeating that's sitting in your gut right now, would have been better if someone else was eating it. So essentially, it would have been better for you to not eat that food and give it to someone else. And so see, we see here that Rasul Sallallahu also says, when someone asks him, what is the best deed? And he said to feed people and also to greet them, whether you know or don't know them. So part of us should be saying, you know, if we have any excess food and we have all these excess things, that we need to, you know, be feeding people, you know, whether whether it's homeless people or whether it's people, you know, overseas that are, are suffering from oppression, just like Syria or, you know, all of these places. I can go and go on a list and, you know, it's funny, I maybe shouldn't have mentioned Syria. Now everyone's going to say, why didn't he mention X, Y, Z? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to heal all those who are suffering and... Uh, give relief to all those who are in oppression. So yeah, the other thing is we need to be conscious of um, how much we're eating and how much we're giving. And for instance, there is the recently founded uh, Sandlit Sandwich Foundation. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. It's an initi initiation started by college students where they meet at uh, ISBCC and they give out uh, bags of, of sandwiches and a banana and maybe some like pretzel or something and they go and they hand them out um, within the city and every every two weeks or so they feed they feed 200 people 400 people you know we need to find a way to get involved in something like this so at least we can say that hey you know i did eat and maybe i did eat over what i should have but at the same time, you know, I also gave too. You know, I gave, I fed 10 people, I fed 20 people, I did this, I did that. You know, and, and so we need to balance. You need to balance our, whatever we have with also, you know, what, what we need to give. And then I'm going to end with uh, an interesting hadith here where Rasul Sallallahu says that the kafir eats from seven intestines and the believer eats from one. So he said the disbeliever eats from seven intestines and the believer eats from one. And the circumstance of this hadith, of this hadith is that a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu to learn about Islam. And so the companions brought him some milk and he drank seven bowls of milk. The next day he came and he took his shahada and the Prophet وسلم, offered him milk again and this time he only drank one. So the Prophet وسلم, asked him if he wanted more and he said he was full. So this man before he took his shahada would drink seven bowls of milk and keep drinking, drinking, drinking and after he took his shahada he only drank one. So here we find that the believer, that the Muslim, when acting upon his Islam, inherently does not eat much. 
But how then, now we're going to say, oh, well, I'm Muslim, I'm a believer. How did I just eat all that food? And this is because, and you know, we can look at this hadith where Rasulullah you know, he says that the one that when they steal is not a believer. And when they lie, they're not a believer. And when they do all these things, they're not a believer. But when they're done, they are a believer. So it's saying, when you're doing that act, you're not doing it out of Iman, is what it's saying. That you're doing it out of love for the self, out of love for yourself, out of desire. And so, ultimately, you know, where we need to find peace and where we will find peace internally is when our soul and the desire of the soul is aligned with the desire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When our soul wants what pleases Allah, that soul is at peace. Mutma'inna. It's at peace. It's a peaceful soul. Because what pleases it is also what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's an interesting feeling. When you do something for yourself and it also pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you can step back and say, you know, I'm happy, I'm satisfied with what I just did. And Allah is also satisfied with it. Rather, many of the things that we do, we know that they displease Allah. Or we know that they may not make Allah happy, but myself wants it, the self wants it. Right? And so we make this kind of divorce between desire and God, when in reality, if we channel our passion and our desire and align it with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us, then we rise. You know what I'm saying? We make progress. We find the peace that we're looking for. We find the spirituality that we're looking for. We find the happiness that we're looking for. And it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Because the Rasul you know, he used to eat sweets. You know, he used to eat, you know, he, he, at the same time, there, there's really a balance here. So, what it means is, ultimately, what we began in the start with, we need to, we need to have moderation. So with that, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take, to allow us to take, you know, the knowledge and some of the motivation that we got here tonight and to put it into our lives and allow us to internalize it so that we can benefit ourselves because you know just just to end you know we don't realize how important this stuff is but we will later and you know the the worst times in my life spiritually was when i had a full stomach i never came to salah with a full stomach and cried for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It never happened. You know, and, and the people who have empty stomachs, and the people who are poor, and the people who, you know, are struggling, they're not uncivilized. They're close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to kind of get this kind of arrogant air that, you know, everything that we have, we worked for it. You know, everything that's in our life, oh, we worked so hard for it, and we did this, and we did that. And everything that we have is a result of, of our blood, sweat, and tears. We need to discard that. We're only here, and we're only in the position that we're in, and we only have what we have because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it be a witness for us, and a blessing for us, and that He admit us all into Jannah al-Firdaus with our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who told us to eat and drink in this type of moderation and that will bring us closer to him and with that I end and we send peace and blessings upon Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we say alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Assalamu alaikum